Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ilan Chaitovitz. I'm part of the team at uh, CAMRARE, and I have the uh, privilege of um, hosting this afternoon's session with these gents over here. Firstly, I'd just like to thank each and every one of you for being here. Today is really important, what you're learning and what you, the people you're meeting, and especially what you're going to be doing afterwards to um, make an impact on the rare community. Um, on that vein, we wanted to do something a bit different with the session. It was structured as a, as a fireside chat, so there's going to be about 20 minutes of um, general conversation about how these gents uh, live their lives and, and how they experience their relationships and key, um, uh, key issues for them, particularly as men, which, which we think is, is a, a, an area which is probably pretty much underserved in terms of awareness and and even um, uh, public health uh, concerns as well, which, which we'll come to. Uh, so just um, by way of introduction and starting uh, in alphabetical order, um, on my far left is Amit Goes. Amit Goes is a motivational speaker and is the global advisor for the charity Billion Strong. Billion Strong is a global diversity and inclusion movement run by and run for people with disabilities. He's also an executive coach and teaches confidence workshops based on the four pillars of resilience, self-belief, empathy, and transformation. David Rose in the middle is a business economics graduate with a background in sales, journalism, marketing, and social media. David is a trustee of the Mitrofanov Support Charity and has volunteered at Great Ormond Street, Great Ormond Street Hospital for 10 years. He now uses his skills in his role as business development manager at Rare Revolution magazine. Tom Staniford, on my left, has only two master's degrees, <laughs> one in European law and the other in psychology. He was the youngest ever British national para-cycling champion. He sits on the board of trustees for the charities Wheels for Wellbeing and the Devon and Exeter, Exe Exeter Institution. He currently works as a freelance marketing <coughs> consultant and lecturer. And it's very important to note that all three of these guys are trying, now trying to raise awareness for rare diseases and to help support and inspire others living with them and trying to make a difference uh, for the wider community. Thank you, gentlemen. So um, when we were talking, and it's, it's, uh, I, I've had the wonderful opportunity to get to know you guys a little bit before today's session and um, hand on my heart, I was, I was telling you guys whilst we were talking, these are three of the most inspiring people I've ever met in my life. Um, and so I'm, I really hope some of that comes across today um, with you guys. But we wanted also to take away, um, move away from the patient journey of a person with a rare disease because you guys are so much more than people with a rare disease. Your, your partners, your men, your sons, and we wanted to learn more about that side of your life. So starting out um, on the relationship side of things in particular, um, how did you find your partners? And how did you having a rare condition affect that? Amit, if you take that first, please. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for having me today uh, here. Um, it's a very good question that you asked. For me, growing up was, was extremely challenging living with a visible condition. Uh, many of us here have red conditions, some visible, some not. For me, I couldn't hide it. It was in your face, you know, going to school, college, university. And growing up in an Asian community in the United Kingdom, when I graduated and got a job, everyone was suddenly like, so when's he going to get married? <laughs> and I'd go to weddings and people would come to me and be like, oh, so when are you going to get married? And then they'd pause and be like, oh, it's going to be really difficult to find someone for him. And we have like this convention of arranged marriages and it's like sort of real life Tinder where you 
exchange photographs between families. Um, and obviously, when my photograph went to the other side, it wasn't received very well. So for me, it was always very, very challenging. I remember one incident where I was at a wedding and an auntie came up to me and asked me the same question and that then said to me, actually, think about it from the parents' perspective. Do you want your daughter to marry someone who's got a condition like yours? And this was her trying to comfort me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was extremely challenging, extremely challenging, but thankfully, with, with the grace of God and everything, I found a beautiful wife who I'm married to and she accepts me for who I am and I embrace that and celebrate that and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, but it's, it's very challenging. It's very challenging. Thanks. David? Yeah, uh, obviously echo that. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I've been with my partner for five and a half years now, uh, recently engaged, so she must be a bit mad to be with me, but there we go. <laughs> um, we, we met online. Um, I was very late to the dating game in life. I think, you know, I didn't have a girlfriend growing up in secondary school, not a sixth form, not a university. I think there was something in my head thinking that, you know, I can have lots of friends and I can talk to women, but I always felt that in the back of my head, you know, what's living with this rare disease I know I felt like I was a bird I think that's the reason what stopped me and it really took until after university to kind of get that confidence but um, yeah we're obviously very very happy now and uh, you know very lucky that it's kind of worked out how it has and you know I'm, I'm aware that I am quite thankful that you know I found someone but equally the sort of arrogant side of me thinks that I've still got lots to offer just because I have lots of health conditions and lots of things wrong with me medically it doesn't take away that you know I'm still a good time, I'm still funny sometimes, like I still have lots to offer and I think that's really important to know. Thank you. Okay, well, um, can you hear me okay? Volume's mm -hmm. good? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, I, uh, I met my partner, um, who later became my wife, uh, fortunately. Um, <laughs> well, fortunate for me, not for her. Um, uh, in, in a typical way, although I'm not really sure that there is a such a thing as typical in love. Um, uh, cycling was a hobby, and I used to frequent uh, a vast number of online cycling forums. And on one of them, uh, they were running a competition to design a bike, and the, the winner would basically have their bike made for them. And um, she had entered this competition, and I had entered this competition a few days previously, and I noticed with disgust that her design very closely mirrored my own. <laughs> and so I did the natural thing, and I messaged her uh, with the threat of an intellectual property suit. Um, <laughs> she took it in good humour, and, uh, and since then things snowballed, and we basically continued chatting. Uh, one thing led to another, and I realised I needed to get my skates on and propose. Uh, We've been married at 26, and we've been happily married for eight years now. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Um, very heart heartwarming stories. Uh, when you engaging with your partners, presumably there's there's been discussions about children or wh whether you want to. Could you please share with us, with the audience, how that's how that's proceeded with you guys? Maybe Tom, if you take that first. Um, well, it's been. I mean, every, as you know, every rare disease is unique and that, you know, there are so few of us compared to the wider population. And even within people within that disease, obviously there are unique people, we're all unique individuals. And, and yet, despite, I can honestly say, for my condition, which is a de novo mutation, so I didn't inherit it from anybody, it's literally a spelling mistake on my genome. Um, I don't know whether I can pass that on. And it's not something that anybody's ever told me. <laughs> and which, which you would think would be, you know, quite high up on the priorities if we're all here to have children and, you know, contribute to civilization and, and so on. Um, it's not something that's ever been addressed by the healthcare professionals I've dealt with. Um, and I have dealt with many, uh, <laughs> in many different departments, in many different centres, and many different countries. Um, it's not something that was ever really considered, which I just found to be very, very odd. Um, and I, I've since come to find out that my condition 
we're not sure if it can be passed on because there are only 16 of us in the world. And I would say maybe six or seven of those are men of an appropriate age. Uh, none of them have children, um, but I'm not in a position to ask whether that's through choice or through lack of trying. <laughs> uh, and so, and, and to be fair, patient confidentiality, I don't know them all on a personal basis. And even those I do know on a personal basis, my relationship with them is not such that I can ring them up and be like, hey Dave, so, you know, how's your swimmers? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a conversation, it's a taboo subject, obviously. Um, that so, question's coming, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just, they're going to watch this video later and be like, mm, why am I being mentioned? Um, uh, so it's just a subject that receives no coverage. And it's not that healthcare professionals don't care. Of course they care. But it's just not something that you've ever considered, I don't think. And it's not something that the, the literature has ever really addressed. Um, so you. I think that it's something that we... If it's one of the takeaways from this talk that you take away with you, is think about, you know, there's a void. There is a void in the literature here, and there is a void in, in the kind of consideration of the male perspective in rare disease. Um, <clears throat> that just seems increasingly bizarre. Thank you. Amit? Um, I was born with a condition called neurofibromatosis type 1, a condition many people can't even pronounce. <laughs> uh, well, normally when I say that in other venues, it comes back with laughter, but we're at a rare disease summit, so I guess <laughs> we're all uh, equipped. Um, for me, again, it goes back to there's a 50-50% chance that my child may inherit the same condition I do. And the conversations around, even before I got married, when, when, when I met my wife and her family were against our marriage because of my condition, there were, you know, the conversations were around, oh, so what if the children end up having the same condition? What will happen then? And it wasn't none of their business, really. You know, it was between me and my wife. And when me and my wife started discussing it, we, we, we looked at, for me, you know, growing up, facing the challenges that I did, like I mentioned, it's a very visible condition. Did I want my child to go through the same condition, same challenges? Probably not. So looking at ways that we can mitigate that risk was what came to our mind. And that's the journey we're on at the moment, me and my wife, is to see how can we mitigate that risk so, you know, my child doesn't inherit my condition but we're, we're still sort of going through that journey at the moment. Thank you. David? Uh, yes, yeah, so my fiancé uh, is a nanny, so she works in childcare, so I think she has maybe a different perception about having kids. So when we first met, obviously it wasn't the first thing we spoke about, but it was even online, online dating, you know, when you fill out everything, it always says, like, do you want children? And even then, at that point, before you've even had a date, it's already asking, you know, you can't even avoid the question. So, when we had the discussions and it went a bit further, obviously she probably understood a bit more about my health and you know, the genetic component is obviously one thing, but equally, you know, every day is different with a rare disease. Sometimes you can get out of bed, sometimes you feel brilliant, sometimes you feel terrible and you can't really predict it. So, you know, for full you know, disclosure, like sometimes it's hard enough to look after myself. How am I meant to look after a crying baby in the middle of the night or doing all the other stuff at 4 a.m. And, you know, I didn't think I would have the energy or the sort of strength to do that. So it's always been something, I've always been very uh, not bothered about having kids. Not as, not, I've never ruled it out, but I never was overly interested anyway, even, even pre-genetic um, condition, knowing that. So, you know, that's always been in my mind. But um, I think from uh, what I can offer someone, that's where maybe I have become more acutely aware of my rare disease or having a genetic rare disease, because, you know, however you look at it, lots of women will want children and it's something that some people will say, oh, yeah, 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 it's fine, like, it's not important, but actually it is important because there's no point in saying on the first few dates, like, I don't care, and then you're wasting each other's time because you need to get that out in the open quite early. Do you actually mean that or do you not? Because if not, I'm not the right person for you. But, you know, I, I think, you know, Sarah and I have a great time, we have a great life, and um, I've got a young nephew, I've um, got four, maybe five godchildren coming at some point, so, you know, 
hopefully people see me as like a cool uncle or a cool <laughs> father figure and we still get to have all that time with them but they're just not our own children but we kind of treat them like our own I think that's something that I can offer of having friends with lovely children but I can't offer that myself and I think that's something that I'm aware of probably. Thanks, David. So just um, last question on the, on the set question piece is, uh, for Tom, you, you mentioned a healthcare gap relating to, to family planning. Uh, what family planning support uh, do you feel might have helped you as a person with a rare, rare condition? Um, I don't really know, because obviously it's a, it's a, very, it's a very personal situation, um, and it's something that I don't, I can't answer on my own because obviously it's a partnership between my wife and I. Um, so it's, it's something that we would agree on together. Um, but certainly in terms of the kind of family planning support that I, I, I would have hoped to have received or had access to, I, I see a lot of medical professionals and obviously none of them are experts in family planning. Uh, they all have tremendous expertise in whatever field they're in, whether it's diabetes, genomics, etc. And while I would not expect them to ever offer clinical advice or uh, professional opinion on family planning matters, I feel it's really in my favour and also in their favour if they do have some awareness of the support services that are within their area. Because obviously I'm, I'm the man in the street, I walked off the street, I have literally no connection with the medical community. Even though you may not be a family planning professional, you do have contacts in that field. In your wider medical network, you know people, or you know people who know people, and therefore you are in a better position to know where they are, what they do, etc. Now, unfortunately, that does place a bit of a responsibility on you, and I know that you're already <laughs> overworked and underpaid, um, aren't we all? Uh, <laughs> and, but at the end of the day, this enhances the care that you're able to provide for people, because obviously we're, we're here at this wonderful conference today, Rare Summit, it's largely on research, clinical, but the thing that I've noticed most about speaking to a number of you is how the motivation is skill to have a positive impact on the lives of people with rare disease. And I feel that having an awareness of this family support in, in your area and being able to just say, hey, I know this lady, Linda, here's her number or here's her website, she does family planning stuff, maybe have a chat with her. And it can be as simple as just having people in your LinkedIn network or having people who you've spoken to once at a conference three years ago and you happen to remember does something in family planning, that's enough of a connection that it will open things up for people like us who are literally in the dark. I'd love to open up uh, the panel to some questions, uh, please, yeah. Thanks so much. That was fantastic and really inspiring. Um, I've just been involved in a project with uh, Metabolic Support UK that have asked their inherited metabolic community about how they can live well in the absence of a treatment. So knowing that potentially, you know, the research is going on, but it may take some time to realise, what kind of activities do you suggest as people working in the rare disease space can undertake, like the family planning support, that can help you live well with your condition. So, so what activities can health providers, you mean, help providers support people with rare diseases to, live them, to let them live well, to help your day-to-day -day life? What, what things would make a difference to your day-to-day -day living from the healthcare uh, services? So what, what can the healthcare uh, services do for you that would make your day-to-day -day life better? I suppose, I suppose I was thinking more about, you know, there's, there's a kind of... So one of the things we, we discovered in the, in the Thoughts into Action report was that people want opportunities for education, more opportunities for employment, you know, access to benefits, other advice. So you talked about the family planning advice, not being signposted to these mm. opportunities to engage in that conversation means you're unable to explore what, op what avenues could be. So, so is there anything that the wider 
system, so I don't know. So perhaps what's the biggest gap in what's their the care? What's the biggest gap in that, you know, not in the, health, but in, in one other One of the parts. things I would mention on that in, in light of mental health is giving that support, knowing that actually people with rare diseases, genetic conditions are going through a mental battle every day. You know, we may not show it, but these challenges as young children like me going to school, my first day of school when I went in, no child wanted to sit next to me because they didn't understand what my condition was. They thought it's contagious and thought, oh, like, he's not important. Giving that mental health support from early age, but also that education to the wider community that these conditions are around and they're, and they're normal. And it's just normalizing it to society because that will give a lot more strength to people who are going through that, that condition, I think. Thank you. So, uh, t Tom or David, as a man, what is the biggest gap you think in the, in the provision of care from society to you? Uh, I'm just a follow on with that. I'm actually very lucky. I actually have um, specialist rare disease mental health counselling. I think that's very unusual. Uh, that's in Cambridge. I'm, that's very lucky that I'm in the metabolic department there. Um, you know, I speak to people all around the world every day for my job, and I don't know anyone else really that's got that even in America where you can pay for it. So, I think I'm quite acutely aware of that. Um, mental health is one thing, but I think just from what you're saying about like, the different things like benefits and all the stuff, I think, and even like family planning to some extent, is that your life changes all the time. So just because I think this now, it might be complete, I might have a completely different mindset on it in a year's time. I think that that's not acknowledged enough. Like just when I saw the genetic counselor, for one example, like um, I was single at that time, had absolutely no reasonable chance of having a child anyway at that point. So it was completely irrelevant to me. If I'd have been offered that now, it probably would have been more useful because I could have maybe slightly more considered about having kids. So just things like that, just to be aware that just because we're all you know, kind of in our 30s now, but we might have one opinion, but it doesn't mean that's our opinion for the rest of our life and our life will change. You know, we might lose our jobs. We might, you know, it could be anything. Like just your, your situation doesn't remain the same. And I think that's something that I've often uh, forgotten about. Um, I think it's it, not necessarily an activity or something from a specific group, but on a wider basis. When people are given a diagnosis for a rare disease, if it is known that that rare disease places their fertility in question, they should be automatically offered a fertility test if they want it. Because then they have it and then they know definitively whether they could, in theory, have children or not. But that, if you like, gives them a green light to then explore further, because at least the question of fertility is on the table. Um, up until then, it isn't. I mean, I, I have since got a fertility test, but I haven't actually taken it. <laughs> and, the, and the reason why is because I'm a bit scared, because it, it's better for me to be hopeful uh, and, and kind of... Uh, not have an unsavoury truth confirmed than to have an unsavoury truth definitively confirmed. So while I have no desire to have children and I don't really foresee that happening, that's a different situation from being told you're not having children. And so, so despite me pursuing and actively hunting down my GP and saying, look, I need a fertility test, um, <laughs> I haven't actually taken it, which is an awful thing. It's an awful thing, but we're, we're all human, you know. We all have our, our curious idiosyncrasies. And it's only when I was presented with that situation that I realised I don't actually want to know. But having the option of knowing is what is important, because obviously other people, it might be really important for them to know definitively. Thank you.